Can you hear me way in the back? Yeah. I'll speak as loud as I can. Next week, I celebrate a milestone. And when they asked me to do this, I thought, well, you got to have something that's exciting. Well, by God, I was born in 1937. That was the year that the International Harvester Company introduced the WK-40. Anybody here ever own one? Look at the hands go up. Okay. We have, in our whole little hometown, Petersburg, Illinois, 50 years ago, next month, was an antique tractor pull. Now, I'm going to kind of give you the rough edges, because we've got a lot of things to talk about. But let me tell you what happened in this tractor pull. We decided, they, I wasn't here, so I was back there. But let me tell you what they did. The man that owns the WK-40, we went out and got a F-30, because every harvester owner has heard of the F-20, F-30, 2236, 1530, NHs, 400s, 450s. I'm going to miss a few, but you got the big picture. But they forgot about the WK. Now the old WK, when we introduced the WK in 37, we as a company built at the Milwaukee Tractor Plant at the time. We built 5,400 tractors over a period of about four years. Now in that period of time, the tractor came about because of the Hoover Dam. Now that's the same Hoover Dam that's south of Las Vegas. The truck division sold a lot of trucks to work on the Hoover Dam. You know what happened? They sold too damn many trucks and not enough engines. So they had to build more engines. Now the Harvester Company had all these six cylinder engines. Now think about this now. 1937, we introduced a six cylinder overhead valve gas and a six cylinder overhead valve diesel engine. And they came back from the Hoover Dam. The guys at Milwaukee said, we'll put them on the line, we'll make a tractor out of it. That is the way the basic WK-40 and the WK series was originated. But the rest of the story is this. The owner of the WK lives in Petersburg, Illinois. I've got to explain this to you, because this is a fundraiser. The JCs came up with this idea of making money using antique tractors. Now, the old WK had six cylinders that had seven main bearings. Think about that. Not five, not three, seven. Piston rings. Not three, not four, but the fifth one was under the wrist pad. Now, I want to tell you something. We were so far ahead in engine design, it was, you couldn't believe it. So anyway, what happened was they decided to go get this old WK out and make it the main theme of the show. Okay. What happened was we had to take it out to the chief engineer and mechanic to get it all tuned up. Now, 50 years ago, there was no tree. A log chain and a cable. You back the WK up to the stretch big oak tree, put the wall chain around it, put the cable around it. And I've got a picture of the driver here. I'll show you in just a second, y'all get to it. We fired her up. And she ran 1750 high to low low. That was really hard. They did let out on a clutch. Wheel started spinning. It was all rubber. Started spinning. We started adjusting the carburetor. Engine RPM, and all of a sudden we said she's combat ready. Boom, she heads straight to the ground. Now, the WK40 had one problem road speed 2.25 miles per hour. <laughs> Any of you ever owned one will remember this. It took an act of God to get around the farm. 
second thing is it happened to us, we were six miles from the fairgrounds. <laughs> now we're three hours before we get to the track, and they're waiting at the track for the WK-40. So at the fairgrounds, they send out five, six, and trucks on every known road that my driver could get the WK to the track. Now then, i got to show you my driver, because he recently retired. And he was 12 years old. 12! And you know what? In that time, we had to put a consent form, and he had to sign this consent form to drive the tractor. So anyway, there he is right here. There he is. Got Ball. I feel the light. Can you get the light in just for a second? Got to look inside of that. There it is. 12 years old. The lawyer said you got to have a consent form. We got the consent form signed. There it is. 2.25 miles an hour. Come to town. 560 picks him up, takes the same log chain, holds him to the fairgrounds. So now we need to sit at the fairgrounds with the WK ready to roll. Okay, so the first track threw up, and you can turn it off, turn it off right now. That, that is, first track threw up, John Deere A. Almost seemingly just from the public, Petersburg, Illinois. Now this is still in dispute some 50 years later. <laughs> That's the first time I've said John Deere for so long, I usually call them yellow wheels. That's <laughs> pretty when you get 80 years old, you kind of forget every now and then. The John Deere pulled one, no, 96 feet, and they had to have a rerun from the down to the measuring stick. They pulled 97 feet. The announcer says, well, we're going to give you 100 feet and shut up, so they ain't the next step. The next pull was an AC UC. Now, some of these old tractors you guys are going to remember. The problem with the AC, we couldn't get it started for the bag. So we had to go get jumper cables. Now we got the jumper cables and we got it started. Then another problem developed. Water started coming out of the radiator. Now then, here's what you call American ingenuity at its highest. We don't go to a horse farm. We go to a pony farm and get pony manure. You put it in a bucket, just like my bucket list. Put water in it. You stir it up. You know what you do with it? You put it in the radiator cap and 30 seconds later you seal the radiator. <laughs> American ingenuity. We got it. But if you do it, do not use horse manure because it's too coarse. You'll clean your radiator out. <laughs> he pulled 105 feet. Next one. F20. F20 pulls down 100 feet. So we got three tractors all within five feet. Four Wayne comes in with a WK. His dad told him before he left the farm, son, if you kill that engine, I'm going to skin you alive. <laughs> All the only thing that 12 year old could remember was don't let the engine die. He pulls up to the track. Now the announcer, if you're in central Illinois, everybody in the world has heard of a gentleman named Dick Allen. He uses words like cute, cute, and all that stuff going down the track. And he's a great announcer. Wayne pulls up. He says, all right, young man, you sure to go. Wayne writes, out on the clutch. The grandstands are full. This is a fundraiser. When he passes 100 feet, people are starting to come from the grandstand want to get out on the track. At 150 feet, Wayne remembers he's dead. Don't fill the engine. <laughs> the rubber tires are starting to crinkle. Next thing that happened is Wayne passed 200 feet. And he's still going. Remember, he's dead all the time. 250, and people are going bananas in the Petersburg Fairgrounds. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, at 298 feet, Wayne depresses the flesh, and we won the contest. 
Now the moral of the story is if it's properly set up, which if it was properly set up, if it was properly weighted, it'll perform. And if you got an experienced driver and told to do what certain things, and we had that, we won the pulling contest. And so this year, the 50th anniversary, they're going to try it again. Oh, we've got a problem. Our WK40 has a cracked head and a cracked block because she went right into rescue. And we don't have a tractor yet, so if you've got a WK40, you might know five people around Holmer, but they're probably be looking for one to drive in the, in the contest. But the WK40 was a forerunner because what it was the first six cylinder engine the harvest company put in. And then in 1940, before the war, we took the six cylinder out, the Slim Indian, Kansas, Colorado, Oklahoma, remember, and we came with the WD, we put the four cylinder back in it because it was love them. Now, People say, could you have sold that tractor? Yes, sir, we could have sold her. First thing we have done, we just we have fixed the field speeds right quick from 2.2 mile an hour, which they put a four, four speed transmission in it, made it a little bit, got a three, I think. We fixed the torque curve. Nobody ever heard of the word torque curve. Now, today, it's a it's always been embedded in my mind how important the torque curve is. So if you had a torque curve, if you had road speeds, and there was a recession in 1937, some of you all have got gray hair, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. Times were tough. So we sold 5,440 tractors across this great United States. Our main competitors got yellow wheels, came with these first diesel engines, in the R, that's the big R, putt-putt, 1947. So whenever you, somebody tells you that he's first with a diesel engine, you tell him, kiss him a cooler, okay? You got it. <laughs> now, let me get to what we're sitting up here in this panel, and I want to tell this story. I left off, back to zone, Went to Chicago, went to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Anybody in here? We took from the Harrisburg district, took the Louisville Tractor Pole in 1971. One of the, there was 110 farmers we took. Now I want to tell you something. You take 110 dairy farmers to a tractor pole in Louisville, Kentucky, from Western Kentucky, and you can't land back in either Pittsburgh or Philadelphia. The telephone lines were busy getting called to get the milkers and to get the house taken care of. But that's a great experience as far as I remember in Harrisburg. But anyway, I went to Minneapolis. I was a sales manager. We had a great organization up there. In fact, it was so good, I'll show you in a minute a picture of some of the things. But this, this right here was pretty well embedded in my system. And that's the IH logo that I carry out front right there. In fact, they gave me that flag and all that. But I need to show you this particular right here, because I was told at this meeting, but you're on your way back into Chicago. Now, before I was in, I was on co-op duty, which meant 50% of my salary and expenses were paid by the Ag Division. The other 50% was paid by the Huff and the CE Division, because I had the TD7, the TD8, 125, the payloader, the 500 car, and they, I was like a stamp. I was all over. Everybody, where, where is he? It took a week and a half to find him. But anyway, I walked in this room, and this is a painted up version of what I was met by the 2 plus 2. Now let me set the stage, and let me tell you a few things here that happened in the late 70s. And these fellows here can all elaborate on. In the late uh, 75, 76, 77, Harvester 100 Arts Market Share, and don't let anybody kid you, we were number uno in 100 horsepower market share, above 100 horsepower. That I know. In 78, we started slipping. And we knew we were going to slip. 
We knew that we had a 50 series tractor coming. We knew that we were in the process of spending $250 million that the harvester company didn't have for tooling. Fixes the farm all plant. At the same time, there was a, my friend with the yellow wheels had taken the 4840 in the south and was selling them like hotcakes. And I mean selling them like hotcakes. Because you can put anybody on a 4840 power chip and shift five down, pull the lever up and down. And it worked in the south. And they sold them. They sold them because of rice fields. They sold them because of cotton fields. They sold them because of land plant. And it was easy to operate. And these fellas in India got mad at me coming. Come on, boys, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go. We spent the money. We had a P1, P2, P3, P4 action program. We had a CAB program. This was all in the process. But the Marine Corps taught me one thing. If anybody's here in the Marine Corps, you'll understand what I'm getting ready to tell you. First lesson in the Marine Corps, you never leave a Marine behind. You go get them. And that's when somebody mentions Benghazi to me, I get a little bit mad and irritated. Number two, Marine Corps said you fight with what you've got. You don't fight with what you hope you have. And I saw that tractor right there and I said, that's what we got. And that's the only thing we're going to fight with. Now, at the same time, this was coming up on the screen. Keep this in mind. You, the American farmer, were shifting. The no-till, min-till, mill-till, and tummy-till, or whatever they're called. 18442 tires with radio were becoming a way of life. You were demanding bigger chemical tanks because they had spray. And every situation that was being brought up centered in on this particular track. Keep this in mind. Harvester Company had all these divisions. You heard Paul and I on this morning talking about all the things they did in trucks and the plants they built. Remember in the Ag Division, we had an actual flow combine, number uno. We had planter people screaming. We had tillage people wanting money. And here I come, sitting here saying, I gotta have some dough. Because we got to go get this guy with the yellow wheels. And I mean we gotta go get it. Now, the thing that took place was at this time in about 1977. Case for the harvester company became critical. I know today the American farmer does not have cash flow problems, but it became critical to us. For us to get quick funds, we had to start selling company stores. Now the company stores were training grounds. Everybody joined the harvest company and went to a company store. And we trained parts, service, the whole ball of wax. We had to start selling stores. Remember the American dollar was starting going up and up and up. Now when the American dollar goes up, the American farmer hurts because we can't export worldwide. And then another thing hit us right upside the face. You remember when interest rates were 21 percent? Uh, they're talking about raising a quarter of a percent now. We were fighting 18, 19, 20 percent. Now, ladies and gentlemen, these were very tough times. And the harvesting company, they, they, they knew I was a co-op. So the guys in the ag side said, well, you go up the hook. You don't talk about 510, 515, 520. You stay away from that TV 30. You stay away from this. We've got to have the dough. And the motor truck people were doing the same thing. So when it boils down to it, its final analysis, all the hours that I spent driving that tractor in the field, we had a special van we put it in. Funniest story in the world, I was in Louisiana, outside of Baton Rouge. This man had nothing on his farm. His roof was yellow, and the color of his paint in his house was green. And here I come with Snoopy. I called him Snoopy. And some people said it was the ugliest thing God ever made. It probably was. But I knew one thing, if I could get this man to drive it, I was going to prove a point. That van pulls up, opens that door, and this thing starts backing out. 
When he gets his thumbs to the front end of your articulation, he goes to his parker and says, stop, get it out of here right now. I said, also bring it on out of there. And man, go. And he said, you boys have got something nobody else in the world's got. And if you know how to do it, you're going to make hay with it. Okay. Now at this time, several other things were taking place. Every morning was almost a thrill. Somebody would call and say, this program slipped because so-and-so machine tool for the 50 series didn't get the farmall plant. Farmall plant, the roofing company couldn't get in there to extend the runway of the farmall plant. We were having surprises every day of our life. But again, it went back to the days of the Marine Corps. The only thing we had to fight with was what we had. And 86 series trackers, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be honest with you, we had stretched that, we had stretched those bow gears as far as we could stretch them. We were out of stretch. And you stepped saying, we got to have a 180 horsepower tractor, we got to have a power shift. Your, we, your power shift was coming. But we knew that I could run with a 180 horsepower tractor with that 3588. So what we also knew was this. That if I could get you in the seat, if I could get a deer in the seat, I could calm a lot of situations. And that's exactly what we did. Several of us went to Phoenix to lay out the introduction of the 2 plus 2 tractor. Now in the meantime, let me just tell you what takes place when you go to introduce something. You've got to have parts. We had to make parts books. We had to have servicemen. The districts had to get the service training going. We had to get parts in the depot system. We had to get all price, the price bulletins were set. A gentleman named Bob Lund said, Bob, remember those lovely days. We thought about the price, but we got the price just exactly where I wanted to find it. We went to Phoenix, went up and looked at Mary Tyler Moore's Theater. Now, let me tell you what Mary Tyler Moore's Theater was a tent was. We knew that if we could get these every dealer, dealer sales, worldwide, into that room, and hear this program, feed them lunch, put them on a tractor, feed them a steak, not knowing any other dealers were in town, we had a winner. I did. Old optimistic bud. So anyway, the program back to Chicago I go. The fellow I had a report to, he and I got along good. I'll be the first to tell you that. Some of you may have known Stan Lancaster. I could probably look Stan Lancaster in the eye and kick him, and he would never say a word. He fired me twice, he cut my pay twice, but anyway, he and I got along real good. <laughs> now, now the part about getting our pay cut from the Hartford Company was a fact. We got reduced twice to save the company. And we did, did we get it back? I guess we got it back in quiet and understanding the whole we got the crowd here today to hear a story about a great tractor. Now, let's go the next step further. I went into Stan and I said, Stan, here's what we got to do. We got to keep the dealers divided. What do you mean keep the divided? The Memphis region is here. We can't bring the Quad City region in when the Memphis region's here. We can't bring the Dallas region's here when the Twin City region's here. Because we don't want to talk. We want to do the selling. He said, it's a good idea. How much money do you need? I need a million dollars. Holy Lord, mercy for mine. He came out of that chair. The next thing we were on the way to the 26th floor. At the 26th floor, we were met by Brooks McCarty. No. Listen to us, Brooks McCarty. It's going to be the same. And we fought. When I left there, I had to make a promise. I made a promise to Brooks McCormick, Stan Lancaster, and the Harvester Dealers Worldwide. I would place 6,000 orders on Farmall Plant the very next week after the show. I will tell you something. You talk about the pay cut, how about no pay? It's what kept going through my mind. <laughs> but I knew if we laid this thing out and did it right, it would work. I want to Matt Stogowski at the plant. Matt, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have the Union Pacific put 36 flat cars in this long bay. 
We're going to put one of them up on a platform, and we're going to build a house over the top of it and put a nice sign on each one of these 36 tractors and head into the West Coast. What do you want to do that for? I don't want anybody to know what I'm shipping out of this plant because at the end of Farball plant, up on that hill, I can't remember the name of the college. There was a candle crew taking a picture up there every day. And you know what? They had yellow wheels. <laughs> and I didn't want them to see what I was shipping out of that plant. We parted it up. We had the railroad yards. People were calling Chicago. What have you got into those targets? I went to the regions. Every region. And I said, I want so-and-so, 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 so-and-so. I want this service man. I want this service man. This service man. I want this product support. I said, I got to have this and this and this. I wanted that 4840 that belonged to Hinsdale out there. At the, after this proving graph that we're going to show. Nobody denied me anything. And the more I kept asking, I kept saying, this is too easy, something's going to happen. The tractors arrived perfect on time. We took one up to Mary Tyler Moore Theater. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you this. Mary Tyler Moore used to come dancing out. I don't know what stage she was on, because we had the whole building. That season passed it to about 250 people. Everybody in the harvest company wanted to hear what was going to be said at that show. Up to, up to Mary Tyler Moore's. Let me tell you basically what we said. We were given the picture that this was going to work because the Air Force built the F-15, the F-16 were coming online. The Navy still had the F-4 Phantoms and they're up to D series. That wouldn't make it around aviation. They said, Bud, you gotta pick a driver for the 3588. I already got one. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Jerry Sullivan, right there. Jerry was our driver. He was behind the curtain with one track. And at a certain time when the bells blew and the whistles fired, he started the tractor up and drove it out. Now, first time we thought he was going through the back end of the Mary Tyler Moore Theater, but he got her stopped. At the meantime that he was doing this, we were in the field. We had 14 tents spread out, and if you come into Phoenix the next time to land, look out the right window. You see the Indian Reservation. We rented that part of the Indian Reservation. The cotton was off. We chopped the cotton. We knew full well, full well. I took that 4840, set aside that 3588. I had 10 shows a day. Eight out of 10 times, I beat him. I didn't beat him by much. I didn't beat him that far, but the point I was trying to prove, I had 150, he had 182. I can do it. Now we gotta get all these people motivated. We've got to get people to think. Articulation, two plus two, turning rates. Okay. Now, each one of these stations, when the guys got out, now some of the fellows have passed. I, I accept that. Ladies and gentlemen, I called the fellows out in the middle of this field. It was a little bit warm. And I said, boys, the future of the harvest company lays right here in this track. Because I knew the 50 series was going to be late. People kept saying, where's the power ship? Where's the power? It's common. And somebody popped up and said, Jesus Christ is coming again too. So anyway, I knew exactly where I was. I knew I was in fairgrounds. Now, we set up these stations. And I emphasized every one of these fellows that had a tent. I don't want you sitting in that tent. When Sam Lancaster comes around, you put him in that driver's seat and they can I don't want one deer leaves Phoenix, Arizona that they did not drive that track. Now, here's what we did. We went to the high downtown when we were staying. On this story. All right, we built 500 rooms. I go over to the Hilton, over in Scottsdale, and I booked a hotel that night, next morning. Here's what we did. The Memphis region, which basically took us to Arkansas, 
all the way to Georgia, Florida. That's the one we had to get. Because we're right in the 4840 country. We're right in power shift country. Now, I gotta admit something to you at this point. Nobody in the late 70s, nobody had a four-wheel drive attached to put on the tractor that was acceptable in the marketplace. The one we had for the 86 series looks like two drunks and an alcoholic coming close together. It was not what we wanted. And people start talking about why the front tires were and that's all lead and lag. We had, we just didn't have it. And I knew the people from here were talking about, they couldn't put an all-wheel drive on theirs. I knew it, I just knew it. I couldn't look at that tractor and say they couldn't put it on. Now, we get this hotel set. So Sunday night, here comes the Memphis troop men. They land, buses, take them out to the airport. What's all those tents out there? Never mind what those tents are, get the bus, let's go. We put them to bed. We get them up at five o'clock, we're getting breakfast. We truck them off the Mary Tyler War Theater up in the north side of Scottsdale. Okay? Mr. Solzman and the crews take over up there. At lunchtime, they all have fun. They've seen the tractor. Now what are we doing? We're going to the field. So we take them down to the field where the Indian Reservation is. Now when they were at the Indian Reservation, the next region was coming in. Planes were coming from all over because we knew every three hours from different points they were coming. We took them to a different hotel. These people didn't know these people were here. Those people didn't know these people were here. Because dealers have a habit. They call up. Do you see Bud? What did he tell you? What did he tell you? And they yak, yak, yak. They're worse than a bunch of old women sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta be perfectly honest with you. Now ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you a couple other things we had overcome. And you overcome it with company people. And I told the story to every one of these company people, my band of angels. Some of them have passed right now. Some of them are getting up there about my age. Some of them are a little bit old. But let me tell you this. We had two choices. Sink or swim. Fight or die. And by God, I said we're going to fight. And I think I feel a spirit, a spark, in every person was out there that this thing was going to sell. And when the meeting was all over with, and everybody left to go home, we were getting ready to go, and the phone rings. You'd never guess who it was. It was the overseas division. You know what they wanted to do? They had heard all these stories. They wanted to come and send a group in to have a special show for the overseas people. Now here is the rest of the story goodbye. In China, the lady that was second in command of the Chinese agriculture, name was Miss Fan, F A N. Little old guy about the AI. She brought half of the Chinese army with her. <laughs> and we got him in the track. Now the moral of the story is this. They bought 40 of them on the spot. I thought, well, my God, if we can do this to 40, I sure can get some GIs and get you excited. But anyway, the story about this thing is this. Here's how it happens. A year later, this fan has to come back to the United States. She calls Chicago. Mr. McCormick, I want to talk to Bud Mule. Boy, you do. I want to have a party for you. Would you get a couple of people? One of your directors, and I won't tell you which one it is, but he used to work for the Harvest Company. I picked him up at Hinsdale Engineering at 5.30. Took him downtown Chicago to this big Chinese dinner. Now let me tell you how this dinner goes. I hate to even say it. There's a highway patrolman in here. It is flood in here right now. <laughs> The first person out this man to the President of the United States. Whoop, we're not drinking water. This is white rice. <laughs> I get up to the Premier of China, Cho In Lao. Whoop. Long short of the story. I was way out the end of the table. 
when the thing was over with, I could pour mine down on the ground. <laughs> I had to. But the your director, I was with him in the Twin Cities. He's a great man. He knows planners, stumpers, backwards, and sideways. And I want to tell you something. He can't drink white rice for nothing. <laughs> we had all the windows in the car rolled out. And when I got him delivered, and I got home, we had a little big dog. I opened up the back door, and that dog always met me at the back door. And the first time in that dog's life, he smelled me. Boom! He was out of there. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I miss work the next day. That's probably the only time I ever miss it. But the Chinese were involved. We get back home, we place the orders. Now, the funniest thing takes place at this point in life. The two plus two is selling. And Memphis, it was selling. It was equaling what was going on in the corn belt. Now, of course, cost was still on 40 inch rows. He didn't know growth spacing with rice. So I mean, it was still just like it is up here. But it finally found out the tractor could confirm. Now, I told every guy at Phoenix, you look him right in the eye and you tell him this. This is the ugliest thing God ever built. And you tell them that they're going 17 miles an hour and slam on the brake, that hood's going to fly right off the front end of that brake. <laughs> and we had rubber straps coming. They weren't there yet. We're <laughs> I tell you what, it makes an 80 year old man feel good. And I can make people laugh. Because it was serious, as you all know, you can imagine. We, <laughs> we get back. And everybody knew exactly what I was going to do when I got back. See this dude right here? There's only a few of those in the United States. I got one. That's a 72, 74, hoping for a 76 and praying for a 78, 88. Big two plus twos. I could see it. I could see all the headlines across from Bangor, Maine to Walla Walla, Washington. The biggest thing God ever made is number one farming king. Because with that, I had big transmission of power ship. Now let me go one step further. Just talk about a minute. We slept with this one here a little bit of the all-wheel drive. There's nothing wrong with that ZF. ZF's a good company. Well, not that good lead light. Everything's good about it. We were exporter because we knew what tires to match. Before you may have 15 5 on the rear and 10 minutes on the front. We didn't know. I we weren't that smart yet. But we were getting smarter. Now, they knew I was going to press for that track. And I pressed. And I pressed. And I pressed. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a dirty secret right now. Well, it's not a dirty secret, it's a proud secret. I'm proud of the people who put it together. Look at the clutch housing of a 5488. It's got a 466 engine in it, DTI engine. If you ever get mad at that engine, you can put a coming gel 10 right to the front end of that tractor. Now, does that tell you where we were going with the tractor? Does that tell you where we were going? Because now the corn belt said I got to have a PTO to drive auger wagons. I, I got to the entire period of my auger wagons. I, was, I could kiss it every time I see an auger wagon. But they were thick. Now, the next thing we're going to have a PTO. And you fellas that had the 4366s, 4568s, I, I, listen, if there's one, I did everything but lie to get a PTO in that tractor. We had every conceivable type of power takeoff that God ever thought of, ever could conceive. We couldn't get it to fit. We couldn't get it in there. I even had a little old Jimmy engine back there running one to run it secondary. But it didn't have enough horsepower to do what you wanted to do with it. We tried. We couldn't do it. But I got I could do it with that. I could do it with that. Now, one other thing happened real quick. And it is a very, very, very important thing to us. We test every tractor before it goes to Nebraska. Now see, I've been away from it so long, I don't even know if they go to Nebraska anymore. I have no idea. 
we knew what those tractors were going to do when they left Hinsdale Engineering. We were permitted 30 hours, 35 hours, somewhere in that neighborhood. Now, all of a sudden, people kept coming back, a new term popped up. Park curve, power curve, lugging building. All right? Take this one sometime. Take this tractor here, because this series here, 50 series, is still got a record that nobody's ever broke in Nebraska. That record is this. Take the PTO horse tire and divide it into the draw more horse tire. That tire frame is 87% efficient. That means we took 87% of that power and put the muzzle's rear wheels. My friend with the yellow wheels, the best he ever did was 83. Kicked him in the butt, didn't he? I want to tell you something, we won that. And one day we got into a, we into a big meeting. I looked up and I said, that guy last week wasn't on our side. We got bought, I tell you. Probably the finest thing that happened to us. Because we were, we were just a cash flow was killing us. I got to meet all the people in Tennessee. Now, we ran into a problem with this tractor here. And the problem was this. They had what is called a rigid frame four-wheel drive. They had earplugs when I start talking about this tractor. Now, I had one thing in my favor. I was told to shut up, don't bring it up, keep quiet. We built 36 of them. We shipped and sold all of them the first afternoon. I was told to get rid of them. 36 of them. I think they were all 72.88 or 70. I don't remember which one of them. Doesn't matter. One thing I was told was shut it. Don't ever bring it up. And produce a market report or product meeting again. Ah, that's not my nature. <laughs> More than one way to skin a cat. I went right straight to the horse's mouth, Mr. Kelly. I said, sir, I want to show you something before you get through telling everybody to strap, strap, strap. We had a transmission running there in Hensley. I don't know where it is today. I had no idea. I explained the transmission to him and why we put it in there. Because we had three ranges in this tractor here. Low, medium, and high with six speeds. Six times three is 18. 18 power shifts. I take something out, put something in, I got a full power shift. And here come the home run pitch. We knew, we knew that the planters were getting bigger, 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 and bigger. And we knew they were getting more technical. And we had an option sitting in that lab right out there, and his girl sitting there running, and I thought that man was gonna have a full view of the mountain where I could sit there and put it in a certain range and I could sit there and move that lever and I had infinite speeds at maximum horsepower from four to six miles an hour. I could go from five to nine miles an hour. It's called very range. We brought the old hydrostat principle back. Now wouldn't that have been something? I had an 18 speed gear drive plus one. And you know what the Europeans said? I heard all this European stuff today from Bob Allen. Let me tell you something about the Europeans. If, the, if you don't make something that big around in Europe, you're not going to sell it. They wanted, they wanted all auxiliary levers so damn big, I couldn't get my hands around it. And we, were, we couldn't do that in the United States. But anyway, long and short of the conversation, this tactic came about. We finally got the 50 on the line. I went to Mr. Kelsey, I said, sir, let me get my old crew, my bucket crew back. Let me get my bucket crew. It's going to take a bucket crew. You want 10,000 orders? I'll give you 12,000. Because that, I knew, would sell like hot cakes with those three transmission options. Our takeoffs and all of them. Chemical tanks, you wouldn't have needed a self-propelled spare. You could have hung it on a, that frame because I had a P4 accident. Now, some of you raised cotton in this room. That P1, P2, 3, and 4 axis program was to take care of 
of when we got better access from all the classes that were in the We were not a dumb company. We were smart. We had it figured out. We knew what we wanted to do. Our problem was what he had right there. He got both back. <laughs> <laughs> but the whole problem was we just didn't have the time or the money. And we ran short. And I said, I, I, I could go on and on and on and on and on telling you stories. I mean, any kind of story you wanted to hear, we, we did it. We did it good. We didn't take the back seat to anybody. And a lot of people didn't like it. I don't care. I, I wasn't running a popularity contest. In the Marine Corps, you don't run a popularity contest either. But if somebody tells you that's your objective to that hill, you better get your butt up off that hill. And somebody's going to fire you. And sometimes I get a little bit riled up. It happens in my great country, but you see my shirt. I'm a flag waver. And let me just say this. Then we're going to get some questions here to let you all ask the bill during the call. What would you do on my bucket list if I had an opportunity to visit every high school senior class in the United States? You know what I'd do with them? I'd tell them how proud I was that I raised my right hand to protect and defend. And explain to them what it is. Then I like to tell them that there's 156 acres in northern France that was deeded to the government of the United States by the French. And it's the only cemetery I ever walked in my life I lost my breath. And I wish every American could see it. It's about Omaha Beach. So when people come to me, I use the word never. Americans don't have to apologize for anything. I resent somebody saying that your country did something wrong. We have fed the world. We trained the world. We can equip the world. And between the combines and the cotton pickers today, I don't think this company is. I, 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 I don't know what our market share is. I don't know what we're doing. But I know one thing. If I had not fucked this, maybe some of these tractors back, you give me this bucket list, you give me this track from here, you give me the new CAD program. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'll put you back in the market in 15 minutes. Because American farmers like to be talked to straight. And we don't want any hanky panky. I can't control the price of corn. It's $3.84 this morning on the market. Hold your corn, because I got an idea it's going to go a little higher. Beans, 940. Hold it. They're going to get a little higher. We haven't got them all out of the ground yet. And that's the way I look at American agriculture. There's three things that are all risk and reward in my life. And I want you to understand how I believe in them. First risk and reward I tell the story of is Joshua. After Moses crossed the Red Sea, he died. Here is Joshua with all the Israelites in Sinai Peninsula. The Lord comes down to him and he said, Buddy, you better get moved. You hit this out to get up and get over that mountain there into the city of Jericho and start taking the Jordan River. Now think about all the risks that man took, his rewards, and the problem today. Second, some way, somehow, before the Lord called him, I want our high schools back teaching American history. I want them teaching about 56 men that wrote our Declaration of Independence. By God, I'm proud of that document. And by the way, by changing it. And third is this, American agriculture. The risk, if it doesn't rain, I don't care what you do, you can't raise a crop. I can't control the price of fertilizer. I can't control the price of seed. I can't control how much sun you get. But I will tell you this. When the reward time comes, save your dollars, please, for the rainy day. And I think the American farmer is now doing it. Now, I said to be 80 years old next week. 
talk to Paul all over the while ago, Paul's 89. We go way back. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I've had a great life. And so it's a tribute to us and the people that made the red paint to have a room like this. I wish I had all of you sitting in the Fire Progress show when Mac Nogowski called up and I had to go to Galesburg. Let me tell you that story real quick and then I'm done. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you the Ewoki Caper story today because that takes too long. When we introduced the 50 series track, 26 Ford Harvard Company said, we're going to introduce the track. Oh, you did a good job. We'll see if we can match it. Fine, you got to do what you want to do. I was at Farm Hall that day. Over the loudspeaker, I go over and park the Matt Bogowski's off. Okay? I took up the match off. I don't know what you did, but you're about to get to Galesburg right now. I got to Galesburg. They had hired a professional actor to take care of the show. They fired him halfway through the first show. They fired the guy. That's when he called you guys all left-handed farmers and right-handed monkeys or something. I don't know what the hell he said. I don't remember. But all I did not know is they handed me this portfolio. They said, Bud, you're it. I said, well, we got a hit. You're out in the middle of that ring. In fact, we got an hour to go. Here's the family. Now, what they had done, they had made, if you said forward airflow, the whole screen started changing to forward airflow and they played a different song. If you said synchronized tank range transmission, it changed back and you had different strings. I couldn't remember all that. But the only one thing I do remember is this. I remember there was 2,500 people in that grandstand. And I started at one end of that grandstand, and I walked to the other end, and I looked, and I pointed, and I talked to everyone in that room with my hands up. And there's another lesson for you in life. Never talk to anybody unless your hands and palms are up, because you're asking for help. When it's like this, Adolf Hitler did it that way. I don't like it. I like palms. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I walked up and down that ring, and that up that time they had made the movie Patton. The only thing I can remember in that movie Patton all the time I was Crack to a Goose. And I kept saying, we're gonna go through them like Crack to a Goose for this time. And I kept walking and, and I always picked out one guy way over that corner, one guy in this corner here, and a lady up the front somewhere to look at. Now if they're laughing and give them keep talking. If they're not laughing, shut up and get out of the way. <laughs> I want to tell you something. I had to introduce the main feature guy. Many of you all were at Hillsborough. It was Jerry Clow. <laughs> all right, now let me tell you. Jerry Clow, many of you have seen Mississippi. And from the later years and the early years, and every time I go to Mississippi, I'd always Jack Johnson and I would always go to Yazoo City. But Jack had a store down there and I'd go see Jerry. The funny story that ever happened was when you sit in his. I, after I got through the first thing, and everybody came on, oh, buddy, you did a great job. But hell, I broke the thing because the thing got worn out changing, you know. And, 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 because I just, I, I couldn't think of things to bring up outside of order, oh, you know, second time, speed and all that, appreciate and all that. But the long and short of it, that, when it was all over with, I go back and sit in the jury's room. They had a van back, knock at the door. Ladies were coming from Iowa, Illinois. You know what they were bringing? Cakes, cookies. Here, Mr. Clower. Here, Mr. Clower. And then no wonder it was that big. I mean, that's one of the things. Can't cook. So anyway, one day, he answered the phone and said, is there a fellow here named Bud Yule? We've got a pumpkin pie. <laughs> I got a pumpkin pie out of the day. But I want to tell you, the people in the harvester company, and later on, I, I, I got the tribute. I'm going to, if you all can sit here, to guys that I worked with worldwide. And I just want to tell you some funny stories about them because they're people that put their trousers on one leg at a time. I knew nobody in the harvester company that ever jumped in a pair of trousers. We were all common GI Joes. And we all had an objective. And the name of the game was March. 
and approve the product. I feel I'm going on something to heaven right now. And he said, I, I knew you were going to mention my name. Fred O'Donnell was a reliability man. Fred had a list, top 10 failure items. Oh, Lord, mercy. Like, I'd walk into a room and I had my list 11 or 12. And Fred was just absolutely, I was on him like crap on a goose, if you know what I'm trying to say. And, but it wasn't personal. It was to get it fixed. Get it fixed. Now I'm going to let it out another one more dirty secret and I'm done. The dirty secret is this. On the 66 and 56 series track, if you hit enough life spikes to you from the stop, you hit enough life spikes, and you go down the road, the tires kind of flop, didn't you? Or you've never noticed they're every time on the track. And then I cured them. I said, well, it's the guy that made, made the tire, but it made the financial for us. What do you mean you got to get the front You make it. Oh, no, no, we can make it. No, no. Go in under the front action. There's a flat piece in there. Take it, shave it off. The red paint off. You know what's stamped on there? JD. I ain't did that crap about that front action right there in there. It never hurt it again. Never. Now, they had no more. That was our fault. And what? But that shut them up anyway for a while, didn't it? So we, I, I've got talked out. I, I talked too long. I accept that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I appreciate it.